morning and welcome to Community Presbyterian Church. We want to thank you um, all for the entire community for joining and logging on with us. That's whether you're joining us by phone or Zoom or Facebook Live or you're sitting there with your daughter and you're watching her computer. We want to thank you for joining us this morning. This is the day that the Lord has made and we're rejoicing and we're glad in it. We know that these are difficult times and we want you to know that we're continuing to pray with you. We're praying for you individually, we're praying for your family, we're praying for our community, and we're praying for our nation and our world. Um, many of you all are having to make some very difficult choices and you've had to make um, some very difficult choices for your families. So we want to thank you this morning for choosing to stay home for choosing to keep yourself safe and for keeping those around you safe. Please continue to use wisdom as you make choices about not going out, about not going to that party, for not gathering um, with all of your family members. This is not a vacation. This is not that time to have a family reunion. Um, this is the time to keep grandma safe, to keep that uncle safe, that you haven't visited in a long time, this is a perfect opportunity um, to make some phone calls and to use video chats and to write a letter. We want to ask you to heed the calls of our public health officials. Wash your hands over and over and over again. We want to ask you to distance yourself and keep those people around you safe. We want to ask and encourage young people to make the choice to keep yourself safe, but to also keep your mom safe, your daddy safe, your grandmother safe, your auntie safe. And we're going to ask all of you all to continue um, to pray with us as we pray for our nation. We love you and we want the very best for you. This is a difficult time, but we're able to sustain this through our faith in God and being able to make wise decisions. So I'm gonna uh, show you what all of you all should be doing as you close out today. And you're gonna see it a lot as we make the right choices. Join with us and stay safe. We love you. Yeah, man, man, that's, that's a tough situation, man. But, you know, God promises that he's going to uh, Keep us and protect us, man. So, but you know, my prayers are with you. God bless you, and uh, and God keep you. All right. Take care, man. Man, what a time is this, man. Whoever would have thought? Whoever would have thought, man, that uh, having hand sanitizer, man, would be so important. But it is what it is. So, man. Oh, here's that letter I've been waiting for. Oh my, this is. I've been waiting for this. Wow. Hmm. Well, my boy in HR told me I was going to be on the next one to get a promotion. Let me look at this. Man, this is good. Ain't God good? Oh, wow. Hmm. What? Here, Mr. Massey, we regret to inform you that we have had to terminate your position due to the current economic. Oh God, this. Oh God, what, what am I gonna do? you I need you in a very very special way and uh, you know you know Romans is my favorite book and uh, Paul even talks about it in verse 37 that in Romans 8 that we are more than conquerors so uh, God I, I need you to come through in a very very strong way and man I got this new devotional this is right on time and it's telling me rejoice and be thankful as you walk with me through this day practice trusting and thanking me all along the way, trust in the channel through which my peace will flow into you. Thankfulness lifts you up above your circumstances. I do my greatest work through people 
the grateful, trusting heart. Rather than trusting and planning and evaluating, practice trusting and thanking me continually. This is a paradigm shift that will revolutionize your life. Man, God, thank you that we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Wow, thank you. Well, praise the Lord, church, and good morning. So strange to be in service this morning um, with no people in the pews. I mean, no people. We have some Sundays where there's not a lot of people, but there's nobody in here this morning. And that's a good thing, um, because what we're trying to do is we're trying to make sure that we care for you as the church in a responsible way. Uh, we're trying to make sure that we do the right thing by you that we truly show you what it means to love one another in what we do. And one of the ways we do that making sure we wash our hands, get that hand sanitizer, wash your hands with soap and water, warm water and soap for a full 20 seconds. Amen? Amen. We're glad to have you all with us this morning. Uh, this morning our service is going to be uh, remarkably different than it usually is, um, but we want to try to make sure that we do give you something that can feed your soul this morning. And as you know, we've been uh, going through a series called The Soul Detox, and I've been really excited about that work, the work that we've been doing in The Soul Detox. Really excited about every message that uh, we've been preaching um, to date, but I decided to pivot this morning. And the reason why I decided to pivot is because of some of the things that are going on in the world today. Sometimes there are things that are happening in the world that demand that we shift, that we pivot. And this is one of those times. This is one of the most remarkable times in all of uh, human history, um, as far as I'm concerned. Certainly uh, with the people who are online watching us today, we've never had an event like this in our lifetime. This is the first time where globally we have had sanctions being made, decisions, laws being enacted that are impacting the entire planet. And certainly it's impacting our houses of worship. And I wanted to see if I could bring you a message today that would give you some encouragement during this time. Um, and so with that in mind, I want to direct your attention to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, and I just want to read to you from verses 31 through 39, and I'll be reading this morning from the New King James Version. Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 39 from the New King James Version, and it reads as such. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all. How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced 
that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Dear God, be with us today amidst all that is going on in the world today, amidst all of the trial and tribulation, the sickness and death, you are still God. You are still bringing life out of dead places, and Lord, you will see us through this time. We ask that you be with us and be with churches all over the world and all over this great nation as we gather to experience worship in new ways this morning. Feed us, Lord, through these new channels till we want no more. Speak to our hearts, speak to our minds, speak to our souls. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. What you have before you today are some of the most powerful words in all of Scripture. Most people would say that Romans is Paul's most important book. In this book, we get all of Paul's theology as it relates to sin and redemption and faith and how to live our lives uh, as Christians. And some people would say that chapter 8 of Romans is in fact the most important chapter in the most important book in all of Paul's writings. And the verses that we have in front of us today are kind of like that moment in a great song um, when the beat drops. You know what I'm talking about? That moment in the great song where, where, where the beat drops and you get excited and, 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 and you start to dance. Amen. And everything jumps off. If I think back to my younger days, um, it was that moment in the club. When, when the new hot song came on, and, and as soon as that beat dropped, the whole club would go wild. That's kind of what these verses represent. The, these verses represent that crescendo moment when Paul says that you win. Amen? That no matter what happens next, you win. That no matter what happened before, you win. That no matter what is happening right now, you win. And I think that's a message that many of us need to hear today, if not all of us um, need to hear today, that in the midst of everything that's going on in the world right now, we win. What I want to share with you this morning and what I want to drill into your heart and your mind and your soul and your spirit this morning is the fact that you win, that no matter what tomorrow holds, what you need to know right now is that you win. That's what Paul is telling us in this text, that we win. But guess what? It's not just about the hereafter. He's not just telling us that because we believe in Christ, that we win when we step out of time and into eternity. Paul is actually telling us that we win right now, right here and right now, regardless of what the circumstances in our world might be. That's what Paul means when he says, that we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus who loves us. Or your version might say we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. What Paul is saying when he says that is that no matter what it is you're facing in life, that through all of the difficulties and all of the hardships and all of the ups and downs and all of the trials and struggles, all of the suffering and all of the obstacles and all of the fear, all of the rejection, all of the hurt and all of the pain, Paul says, you win. That we're more than conquerors through Christ Jesus who loves us. More than conquerors. Those are uh, familiar words and that's a familiar verse of scripture um, to those of us who have spent any time around this great institution that we call the church. We love to say that we are more than conquerors. But, but what really does that mean? If you look at that word conqueror in the Greek, interestingly enough, uh, it's the word nikeo. Uh, it's the same word um, that we get the brand name for some of our favorite sneakers from, um, the brand name Nike. Um, comes from that Greek word, Nikeo. And the word actually means 
conqueror. It means uh, victorious or victor. It means triumphant or, or, or triumph. And, 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 and we associate that brand Nike um, with champions, right? Uh, it, it, it technically, it means champions, and we associate that brand Nike with champions. Uh, we hear Nike, most of us, we think about um, somebody like Michael Jordan, um, who is widely considered by many of you um, to be the greatest of all time, what we like to call a GOAT. I know a lot of you are missing um, your sports right now, um, and so you really don't want to talk about basketball, but a lot of folk consider Michael Jordan to be the GOAT, and Michael Jordan's name and image became synonymous um, with Nike, a word that means champion. Um, subsequently, we've had other players um, who have also represented that brand, uh, LeBron James and now even Zion Williamson, and, and it is a brand and a name that is associated with uh, being a champion, but the actual word Nike comes from a word that means champion or victorious or triumphant. And, and that's the word that Paul uses here for conqueror, the word Nikeo. Um, but Paul doesn't just say Nikeo here. He doesn't just say that we're conquerors. He doesn't just say that we're champions um, in this text. Uh, what Paul says is that we are hyper Nikeo. Hyper Nikeo. Which means that we are more than champions, or we are super champions, or we are super victorious, or we are um, super triumphant. We are exceedingly triumphant, Paul says. And what Paul is really talking about here is Paul is talking about what it means to have a champion's mindset. And I want to see if I can help you this morning to develop a champion's mindset, uh, mainly because anything else is contradictory to what the Bible teaches. To have anything other than a champion's mindset is contradictory to what the Bible teaches. Unfortunately, I encounter a lot of Christians who have a, a mindset that is contradictory to what the Bible teaches. I talk to a lot of Christians on a daily basis and and, and I greet people like most of you greet people. I say hello, and um, I'm a hugger, so I'm used to doing a handshake and a hug. Um, but now, you know, I'm doing the elbow bump. I'm trying to, you know, practice my social distancing and whatnot. Um, but I still often greet people with the same words. I say hello and how are you, right? And, and, and it's interesting when I say how are you to some Christians, some of the responses I get. Uh, oftentimes when I ask somebody, how are you, um, I'll get a response like, oh, oh I'm holding on, Rev. I'm, I'm holding on. And, and when, you, when you hear that and you listen to them talk and you connect that to the rest of their conversation, you understand that they don't mean that they're holding on to God's unchanging hand. They mean they're holding on for dear life and they're about to let go. Sometimes I, I ask people that question and they'll say something like, uh, oh, I'm, I'm making it, I'm, I'm making it. And, and when you listen to the rest of their conversation, you understand that they don't, they don't mean that they believe that God will make a way out of no way. They mean that they are barely surviving. Or some of them who have been in church more and who try to color their speech um, with the right kind of gospel talk, um, when you ask them this question, um, they might say, well, I'm just trusting God. And that sounds good, right? That sounds right. That sounds like they're moving in the right direction. It's certainly better than I'm holding on or I'm, I'm making it or I'm just trying to make it. But when you listen to them oftentimes and you connect that, I'm just trusting God to the rest of their conversation and, and the rest of the things that they have to say about their lives, you realize that they don't really mean that they're putting all of their faith and their hope and their trust in a God who can do all things. What they really mean is is, I've tried everything else. May as well try God. Interestingly enough, Paul doesn't use any of this language that interjects of doubt or, or interjects of anything that might mitigate the power of God in his life or anything that expresses any kind of a sense of hopelessness on any level when Paul talks. And you find this throughout scripture, but particularly here in these verses, when Paul talks, Paul talks about being a champion. 
Paul talks uh, in, 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 in terms that suggest that in light of all that he's been through, or in spite even of all that he's been through, and all that he's going through, and all that he might go through in the future, that because of who God is, he is more than a conqueror. The question for many of us is, how do we get to that place? How do we get to that place where Paul is, where we express our faith in terms that suggest that we are more than conquerors? Because if the truth be told, a lot of us are not there. Amen? Well, if we look at Paul's writings, um, I think we can find some help um, this morning. Um, uh, Paul says that his, his champion's mindset, his victory mindset, is all wrapped up in God's love for him. Yeah. And what's interesting about that is if you listen uh, to, to a lot of Christians, yeah. the way we talk about our faith and our relationship with God, it's all wrapped up in our love for him. Amen? Our love for God. And it's a subtle distinction that Paul makes here that, that we need to pay attention to. Paul says that it's not your love for him that makes the difference, but it's his love for you that makes the difference. That's an important distinction because when you look at it, uh, when you look at it that way, instead of victory being wrapped up in your love for him, the fact that it's wrapped up in his love for you takes it from being something that you do for him to being something that he does for you. And that's important because what that does is it takes it out of your hands. It takes the pressure off of you with your imperfect, uh, inconsistent, unpredictable, unreliable, sometimes up, sometimes down, barely holding on self. It takes the pressure off of you and what you can and cannot do, and it puts everything in the hands of a God who can do all things. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you, brothers and sisters, that is the game changer. That's the game changer. And, and Paul is trying to help us to understand how we can develop that mindset and how we can get out of not just our own way, but how we can get out of God's way and how we can let God be God in our lives. And Paul does this by asking five questions in this text. And, and with this text, like so many others, we get caught up with the end and we miss the beginning. Like so many other things in life, the end doesn't make sense if you don't know the beginning. We, we love to talk about how we are more than conquerors. And, 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 and we love Paul's words at the end of these verses that I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities and powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We love those verses and we love to recite those verses. Those are some of the most powerful and beautiful and eloquent uh, verses in all of scripture. But guess what? Those things don't make any sense sense if you don't understand the beginning and if you don't understand some things about who God is. And, and so Paul uses these five questions beginning in verse 31 to help us understand some things about who God is. And we find the first question about halfway into verse 31. It says, if God is for us, who can be against us? This question is really about where your trust lives and where your hope lives and who you believe God is. What Paul is saying with this question is, is that you and God is a winning combination. Amen. That you plus God is a winning combination. I like the way Eugene Peterson says it in the Message Bible. Eugene Peterson says, with God on our side, how can we lose? With God on our side, how can we lose? We need to understand that in times like this, that no matter what it looks like, no matter what the situation is in the world, with God on our side, we cannot lose. 
We've already been guaranteed the ultimate victory, but right here in the here and now, we've got to understand that with God on our side, we cannot lose. Amen? That's something that we all need to understand. The next question that Paul poses in verse 32, he says, How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Now, I don't know about you. You might be a Bible scholar. You might have one of those minds that you do puzzles well and you do riddles well, and that might make a lot of sense to you. But when I read, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things, that, that doesn't help me. Amen. And so I'm thankful that we have other um, translations and interpretations that can be helpful. And again, I like the way Eugene Peterson puts it in his message Bible. Eugene Peterson says, if God didn't hesitate to put everything on the line for us, embracing our condition and exposing himself to the worst by sending his own son, is there anything else he wouldn't gladly and freely do for us? In other words... There is nothing my God cannot do. Amen. A couple of weeks ago, I posted a video of my son on Facebook. He must have been, I don't know, maybe three years old at the time. And he was sitting um, in his car seat in the back seat of my car. And he was singing a little song that he learned in school. And I often go back and listen to him sing that song because of what it does for me. Amen. And I wish I had him up here. I'd make him sing it himself. But the song goes like this. The song says, my God is so big, so strong, and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. It says the mountains are his, the rivers are his, the stars are his handiwork too. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. That's what Paul is trying to communicate to you in that particular verse of scripture. He wants you to understand that there is nothing that your God cannot do. When you face life with that perspective, it changes how you walk, it changes how you talk, it changes how you live your life when you understand that you serve a God who can do anything but fail. The next thing Paul does in verse 33, he says, um, who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? Or again, as Eugene Peterson puts it, who would dare tangle with God by messing with one of God's chosen? I like that language. I'm used to that language growing up in the neighborhood I grew up in. You wanted to have some people um, that had your back, amen, so that other people knew not to mess with you because of who you were in relationship with. And that's what this verse is about. This verse is about the fact that because you are in a relationship with God, that powers and principalities and rulers of darkness better watch out for who they're messing with because you are God's chosen. Amen. And sometimes you need to affirm that to yourself. That's really a key word um, in that verse of scripture, the word chosen. Chosen is an indication of who you are in God. Who God knows you to be. And sometimes in the face of adversity, you need to affirm to yourself that I am a child of God. Sometimes in the face of adversity, you need to, 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 to affirm to yourself that I am blessed and highly favored. Sometimes in the face of adversity, you need to affirm to yourself that I am the head and not the tail. I am the lender and not the borrower. I am the first and not the last. Paul is reminding us to remind ourselves of who we are in God. And then in verse 34, Paul says, Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God the Father and is also interceding for us. And what Paul is saying there is that you've got a friend in Jesus. What Paul is saying is that no matter what it is you're going through right now, no, no, no matter what um, charges have been brought against you right now, that, that you've got the best advocate in the entire universe. You've got the best lawyer 
that money can't buy. Amen. You've got a friend in Jesus. And so I want to remind you this morning that no matter what it feels like, that, that no matter what the situation is right now, that Christ is not only aware of your situation, but he's making intercession on your behalf. And who better to make intercession for you than the one who sits at the right hand of God the Father? Something that we have to understand. And finally, Paul says this. Paul says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? He says, not trouble, not hardship, not persecution, not famine, not nakedness, not danger, not sword. In other words, in a world where so many things are uncertain and unpredictable, the one thing you and I have to know is that we can count on God come what may. Then no matter what the situation is, we can count on God. So five questions, five answers, five different levels of understanding that we need to have as believers. But, but the challenge is, amen, there is a challenge because we read these verses and, and we hear an uh, exposition of those verses and it feels like I got this. But here's the challenge. The challenge is taking what we know and understand in theory and making it into what you believe functionally. Amen. The challenge is taking what you know and understand in theory and making it what you believe functionally. So, so taking it from something you say uh, uh, to something you live. Amen. Taking it from something you say and making it into something you live. And if we look at this text as a whole, all Paul is doing here is he's giving his testimony. He, he's telling the story of his journey with God and how God brought him through hardship and persecution and famine and nakedness and danger and the sword. And what Paul is trying to do for us here is he's trying to show us that we all have a testimony and that our testimony is not just about the hardships and the things we've been through, but, but our testimony is about how faithful God has been through it all. In my mind, it goes back to uh, one of my favorite songs, that old Andre Crouch song that talks about through it all. Amen. It talks about uh, uh, through it all. I learned to trust in Jesus. The song says, I thank him for the mountains and I thank him for the valleys and I thank him for the storms he brought me through. For if I never had a problem, I wouldn't know God could solve them. I'd never know what faith in God could do. If you look at Paul's life and if you look at his own account of his own life, how he was arrested and beaten in Jerusalem, how he was imprisoned in Philippi, how he was stoned and left for dead in Lystra, how he was shipwrecked off of Malta, how he was imprisoned in Rome. This isn't some theological posturing that Paul is doing in these verses. This isn't something that Paul learned um, in a Bible study or in church on Sunday. Paul actually lived this. And I almost want to pause and tell you that that's why it's important that you have at least some people around you who have lived through some things. Some people, uh, uh, particularly people that are speaking into your life, some people who have gone through some things. Because believe me, it makes a difference when you've lived through some things and you've seen what God can do in the midst of failure and in the midst of everything going wrong and in the midst of all hell breaking loose in your life. Someone who has lived through that and seen what God can do can tell you some things that somebody who hasn't been through that cannot and it makes a world of difference when you speak out of a place of experience. And, and what Paul is saying here is that he developed his champion's mindset out of his experiences of what God can do. And he was able to develop a level of faith that allowed him to say, and, and not just him. And, and this is what I really love about these final verses uh, that we have in front of us today, uh, verses 37 through 39, um, that, that Paul isn't just saying that this is for him. 
He's saying that, that this reality, this truth, is yours as a believer. This is why you have to pay attention to pronouns in the text. In verse 37, Paul says, We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. We are. He's given you his entire testimony, and, and he says, we are. Not I am, but we are. Paul wants you to be able to embrace this same reality and this same truth for yourself. And he says, because he is able to embrace this reality, and if you can embrace this reality, then you can say for yourself, I am persuaded mm -hmm. that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, or things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, my Lord. Because he loves us so much, we can be persuaded that no matter what's happening in the world, every little thing, is going to be all right. Amen. Lord, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you for your loving kindness. We thank you that you are God all by yourself. We thank you that in the midst of everything that is going on in the world, that you still sit on the throne. Do you hold death and life in the power of your hand? And we thank you that we have an advocate that sits at your right hand who is interceding for us. I want to pray for everybody out there who is experiencing hardship at this time. Whether it's emotional or psychological hardship, whether it's physical hardship, sickness in your body, or loss of wages, loss of income. I want to pray for you that God would sustain you as only he can. I want to pray for you that you would have a champion's mindset in the midst of adversity, that you would be able to declare in the face of adversity that you are more than a conqueror because God loves you that much. I pray that every message that you hear spoken to you or spoken whether it's spoken to you by people or externally or the the things you speak to yourself that every message affirms that you are God's beloved that you are God's chosen that God cares for you that God loves you praying for everybody out there this morning have a champion's mindset and know that God truly cares for you If you're watching us on Facebook this morning or on Zoom, we want to encourage you to send prayer requests in. Uh, we do have people who are watching our feeds and who are looking for those prayer requests. And we want to be able to pray for you throughout the week. And we thank you for tuning in to our uh, message this morning. And I pray that the rest of your day um, be blessed. Amen. Amen.